13 and 314 for a shooting at Century Theaters. They're saying somebody is shooting in the auditorium. Roger, keep your fires west of the smoke. It's red hot. I had an officer hit. Send me the world. Don't go over that fence. Don't go over that fence. Grab the shotgun again. Welcome to Tactical Tangents. Welcome back to Tactical Tangents. This is Mike. This episode is brought to you by Palm Industries. I have maintained for a long time that pepper spray is a way underused tool in law enforcement. And I get it. When you have to arrest someone, you do not want to have to get that stuff on you. But in personal defense or concealed carry scenarios, you want to create standoff and increase the distance, not go hands on. I can tell you hundreds of stories about confrontations I have been involved with in real life that were resolved with some form of less lethal long before a gun would have been an option. Why not carry some in your pocket? Palm pepper spray is small, easy to carry, and it's a effective. If you need something in between harsh words and a gun, this is a $12 solution. It's available on Amazon, makes a great gift. Go check them out at palmpepperspray.com. That's palm, P-O-M, pepperspray.com. And this is Jim. This episode is also brought to you by Manus X. We've talked a lot about the tactical fantasy on this podcast, and one of the quickest ways to break your tactical fantasies and actually improve your, your performance is by getting real feedback. One of the ways you can do that is with Manus X. You're not going to get better at shooting on your own. You need practice, data, and coaching. And you need to make the most of your ammo with good live and dry fire training. Manus is a family of training devices that tracks you while you train. It times and tracks everything you do in a drill and coaches you as you go. It is indispensable to taking your shooting to the next level. Go find them on manusx.com. A few weeks ago, I was trying to find a cartoon about airplanes to show my kids on one of the streaming services. So, you know, I'm clicking around trying to find like the Disney airplanes movie. And I found what looked like a cheap knockoff version of the Disney Planes movie. And I was like, huh, this should be interesting. So hit play, start watching, you know, get some popcorn. And uh, it was really funny. The good guy airplanes were like MiG-29s and Chinese J-11s. And the bad guy airplanes were these dirty rotten F-15s that were always trying to sneak in and steal the good guy's oil. It was neat. And it reminded me that we probably need to talk about Russia and China. Now, just to kind of lay the foundation, I want you to think about basic conflict. All parties in a conflict typically want the same things. They want to survive. They want to survive on their own terms. And they want to exert their will on their opponent. That's true in a playground fight. It's true in a tussle with a robber in 7-Eleven. And it's true in big geopolitics and warfare. All parties also typically understand that as soon as that first punch or those cannonballs or those ballistic missiles go flying... Man, the, you were introducing a lot of risk and cost and uncertainty. And that shared understanding tends to lend some predictability and safety to an otherwise chaotic and dangerous world. So it's time to talk about what the U.S. government is calling uh, mostly global competition. And that's the term of art for America's tension with Russia and China and to a lesser extent, Iran and North Korea. Now, as I record this, we just wrapped up a uh, big old balloon turkey shoot 2023, and President Biden just did a visit to Ukraine to mark one year into the Russian invasion. Russia just suspended its participation in the START nuclear, nuclear reduction treaty. There's clearly a lot going on in the world, and it affects us at our little tactical level, so we need to understand it. And further... We need to understand not just how it impacts like military folks, which that should be pretty obvious, but also how it impacts cops and civilians, because it does. And in fact, I would argue, and I am arguing, uh, it maybe affects you more than the military folks. So bear with me. We're going to talk through what that and what it means. Now, this stuff is hard to talk about. There's a reason it has taken me a while to do this episode. It's dynamic in that it changes a lot. And international relations can be both squishy, as in like tough to pin down, and also opaque. Countries are being intentionally shifty and secretive. Speaking of secretive, as soon as we start talking about Russia and China, the reporting on it gets real sensitive real quickly. So I have to make a point out of professional obligation to stick only with very broadly understood open source stuff, stuff that you can watch on C-SPAN or read in the published U.S. National Security Strategy, and... 
uh, the big reporting, right, that you see in big news, BBC, LA Times, Wall Street Journal. So anything I'm talking about here, you can source back to that. Another factor that makes this tricky is the situation is so dynamic that even talking about it changes it. Now, I don't think Putin's national security advisors like listening to this one episode and adjusting the Russian nuclear like DEFCON readiness level over it. But if enough people use words like war or even cold war, that's going to change how this goes. And that's a big reason when you see government officials talk about this, they get real like hesitant because they're trying to be real careful with their words. So to give you a little background and context, and there is a lot of background and context, like thousand years, depending on who you ask, um, I'm going to give you just the short cartoon version. Now, back when I was a kid, the U.S. and its NATO allies won the Cold War against the Soviet Union and its Warsaw Pact. And incredibly, we did it without even firing a shot. That changed the world. It reshaped the world in big ways. Right around that time, in that same era, the U.S. led a successful coalition against Saddam Hussein in Desert Storm. And that shocked the world and reshaped it also. It shocked the world in how much advantage we now enjoyed in warfare. We had all kinds of crazy tech that people hadn't even really dreamt of. Smart bombs, stealth bombers, drones. And most of the rest of the world didn't. They had like some tanks. The magnitude of American supremacy at that point in the early 90s was so outsized compared to everybody else that we weren't just a superpower. We were like the mega power. I remember reading news articles, reporters trying to come up with like some new word for it because they never even contemplated it before. Going into the 90s and through the 90s, we had some skirmishes. You know, there's Somalia, Serbia, Kosovo. And the rest of the world started taking notes. And they noticed, among other things, that we are getting increasingly tech-reliant. And that we have very little tolerance for military casualties. Especially when we're out doing the global police mission thing. 2001 hits. 9-11 happens. Off we went into Afghanistan and Iraq. And that is where this story starts getting a lot more interesting. Somewhere around... And it's debatable, but we'll call it 2007-ish. Both Russia and China looked around and they saw cracks in the U.S. economy. Stuff like the 2008 housing crash. They saw our growing national debt. And they saw that we were frankly distracted fighting two wars at the same time in Iraq and Afghanistan. And either together or separately, and I'm not sure which, Russia and China saw an opportunity a chance to regain some leverage against the West, some primacy. They both started dumping a ton of money into the national defense, like updating and modernizing. They both started drawing up strategies to gain regional and then global influence and to restore what they see as their rightful places in the world. And they weren't real quiet about it either. In 2007, Russia launched a pretty major cyber attack against its neighbor Estonia. And also, um, in that same era, China conducted a successful anti-satellite missile test. They shot down a satellite just to prove to the world that they could. And when that happened, we mostly ignored them. We had other fish to fry. We had Al-Qaeda to fight. We had Bin Laden still out there somewhere. And we were more or less in cooperation with both Russia and China on a lot of issues. We were pretty friendly. But there's a big difference between being friendly and being friends. And around 2014, it became strikingly clear that Russia and China were on the move and in weird ways. Russia conducted a gray zone invasion of eastern Ukraine, something short of a full military invasion like what we saw last year. Russia used mercenaries and supposedly Ukrainians that were loyal to the Russians and The media didn't know what to call these troops, right? Because it wasn't the Russian army. So they called them little green men. And China started building islands and claiming territorial sovereignty over giant chunks of the Pacific Ocean. They'd find a little reef, uh, dump a ton of sand on it, build it up into an island, 
put a military base on it and say, this is now ours and everything around it. And both started employing more serious anti-access area denial strategies, A2AD. That's a fancy military term for mostly the military hardware that makes it tough for the U.S. to threaten them conventionally. That's mostly a combination of advanced air defenses and ballistic missiles that can strike U.S. bases. And here we are now. Chinese surveillance balloons circling the globe, a massive Russian invasion with regular comments from senior Russian officials about the potential for nuclear escalation. It's getting pretty exciting. Now, Russia and China are very different countries. They have different economies, different political personalities at the helm, different populations, culture, history, geography, food. So they have to be looked at separately. But for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to pair them up. But understand that's an editorial choice and doing it to keep it simple and also to keep it uh, like not classified. So bear with me on that. But when you are working on this, take them as separate. Okay. So what do I think you need to know about it? Well, we start by trying to figure out what they're trying to accomplish. What are their aims and goals and motivations? What do Russia and China want? Now, in some ways that's comp complicated. And in some ways it's very simple. They both want to move up in terms of prosperity and power. China has a whole lot of mouths to feed. They have to keep the, the engine running or literally they're going to starve to death. So things like fishing rights are no joke to them. They're a matter, that's a matter of national survival for them. One of my favorite analysts used to tell me about Russia. He'd be like, Jim. You're, you're going around this Putin thing all wrong. You don't understand. Putin doesn't wake up every day trying to like think about how he can screw over America. He's mostly just trying to think about Russia. He's trying to make Russia great again. I thought that was insightful. They want power. They want leverage. They want prosperity. And they seem to see that as zero sum. In other words, for them to make gains, they think we need to lose. They also want to be the source of order in the world and resent the hell out of us assuming that role. And from their perspective, we kind of stack the deck against them. That we set up the world order in a way that put them at a distinct disadvantage. I don't necessarily agree with that, uh, but that is how they see it. So knowing that, they probably don't want us all dead. Like the total destruction of America is probably not real high on their list. They mostly just want to see us on a leash in order to advance them. So that at least gives us like a basis to start from, right? Now, you might be wondering where we stand militarily. Uh, after all, the last two American adventures in Iraq and Afghanistan didn't end too hot. And I would caveat on that. We may not be great on nation building, <laughs> That's tricky, but man, we are the undisputed reigning world champions at nation unbuilding. We can dismantle Russia and China militarily. There's very little question in my mind about that. We have seen the Russian military grind itself to a halt in Ukraine, and some of that was Ukrainian will and fighting spirit and cleverness, and some of that was American hardware. But a lot of that, a surprising amount of that, was Russia literally doing that to itself. The Chinese military is a little different story. They are developing rapidly, and they're going to get better quickly. Uh, but right now, they've got some pretty big gaps. And specifically, I, I see their gaps in terms of their ability to project force. They might have a million-man army, but it's tough to move a million-man army anywhere that matters. And my running joke with that is like the million-man swim. How are they going to get to Taiwan? I don't know. But... Uh, it's tough to move enough people to matter, right? Now, I should caution that just because we can beat them, quote-unquote, doesn't mean we want to have to fight them. Both of those countries can still deliver a lot of casualties and inflict a lot of pain on us, and they both know that. So how do we, how do we assess that? Well, risk is a big deal here. Risk is a huge deal on tactical tangents. It's a big part of our thesis as a program. And especially when we start talking about nuclear weapons, uh, risk is kind of the dominant consideration. So basic operational risk management, you identify the hazard, figure out how likely and how severe it is. 
So the hazard here is being on the receiving end of a full-scale nuclear strike. How severe is that? Well, Jesus, that's literally the most severe thing most people can imagine. That is severity level gonzo. Right? It goes yellow, orange, red, crazy. Receiving a nuclear strike, that's up there, right? What's the probability? Uh, well, that, that's trickier. Uh, it's low. I don't think we're going to go to... I don't think we're going to go to blows. But it sure as hell isn't zero. And even on the best days, there's some chance that we're going to be on the receiving end, right? Someone can make a mistake. Um, there could be uh, some sort of equipment malfunction and the, you know, the, the system's launched or we think the system's launched and then off we go. And we're not having the best days. Like I said, the, the, the tension right now is, is pretty stark. And that leaves a lot of opportunities for missteps and uh, dumb risks and personalities. And I don't love that. So how do we quantify that in a meaningful way? Well, hopefully, I'm pretty sure someone does quantify this. The National Security Council, the, the big federal research labs like uh, RAND and Los Alamos and, and Sandia, they use their supercomputers and gonculators and crunch numbers. So hopefully someone at NORAD and STRATCOM is working on this. But let's say for the purposes of this discussion that the chance, the the probability of being on the receiving end of a strike is like 1 in 10,000. That's pretty low, okay? And the odds can be low, but because the stakes are so high, it has to change how we think about it. And when we're dealing with these small probability, high severity events, even small changes in probability should get our immediate undivided attention. So let's say since the Ukraine invasion, Russia's combat losses are mounting and Russia's economy is crumping. It's because the, the sanctions are working and they're getting more and more isolated. And Russian officials are talking more and more about nuclear options openly and regularly. Let's say those odds went from 1 in 10,000, like I said, to something like 1 in 100. Well, the difference between 1 in 10,000 and 1 in 100 is huge. That's a big darn difference. So we probably ought to do something to cut either the probability or the severity and dial down our overall risk. And we got to do that in a way that doesn't incentivize more aggressive behavior from bad actors in the long run. That's the challenge here. Helping that is the fact that China needs us economically, and we need them. And that's also true for Russia, but kind of in a different scale. <laughs> the real mutually assured destruction in a war with China is financial. And that's actually really serious. I mean, look around your house. Almost everything you buy was made or parts of it were made in China. They're a huge part of our economy. They're a huge part of what makes our economy work. And we know that and they know that. And as long as two countries are doing business, it is tough for them to go to full out blows. There's a saying and it's not perfectly true, but it's, it's true enough to be useful that there's never been a war between two countries that have a McDonald's. Um, Commerce has a way of calming things down, usually. So we got that going for us, which is nice. Now, in the Chinese playbook, and to a lesser extent the Russian playbook, they take those considerations into account, right? They don't necessarily want to get into a big fight with us. They don't want to get in mutually assured destruction with us. They don't want to get in a dogfight over the Taiwan Straits with us but they want leverage on us and they don't gain much by trying to fight us outright. So most of the leverage they're seeking is economic. They're seeking dominance in raw materials like rare earth metals and energy because those are global centers of gravity. They have an outsized amount of influence on the world if you control them. And that's largely what Russia tried to do with Europe over natural gas, right? threaten the natural gas supply into Europe that, that 
keeps the houses warm over the winter, keeps people from freezing to death over the winter. And you can convince them not to intervene when you invade a country in Europe. Um, separately, but in a similar light, uh, when the Australian Prime Minister started asking for investigation into China about how they handled the COVID outbreak, China slapped Australia not with a cruise missile, but with massive tariffs and a ban on a, a wide range of, of items, but specifically beef and barley imports. Things that they knew were going to cause pain in Australia. So the Chinese would rather not get into that big dogfight over the Taiwan Straits, right? Fighting American F-35s and F-22s, um, you know, isn't going to get them much. If anything, is going to get them schwacked, right? They would rather that we get so economically bankrupt and chaotic and confused in our domestic politics that we don't even have the will or the money to fight them over Taiwan. They want us so distracted and poor and internally crazed that we don't care what happens about Taiwan. That's what they're going for. That's classic Sun Tzu, right? Win without fighting. And if we do fight, it probably isn't going to be main territory against main territory. We're probably not going to invade Beijing. And Russia probably isn't going to try to roll tanks into Florida. More likely, it's going to be, if there are fights, it's going to be proxies, as in third parties, both government and non-government. And it's going to be out on the periphery, like as far away from the main player countries as they can get. So not terribly unlike the Cold War skirmishes that we had, you know, like Vietnam, Korea. And that's why, although it's important for us to modernize our conventional nuclear fleets, and we need to do that, uh, keeping stuff like special operations forces, close air support, uh, keeping that around is probably a good idea, right? Ballistic missiles are not well suited for peripheries and proxies. Those little skirmishes, those savage wars of peace, that's where we have to work by and with and through a partner force, a state or non-state actor. You need special forces for that. You got to send in green berets and all of the uh, infrastructure that supports them. So with all of that, what you get is what some academics call total war. Well, total war sounds scary. And I think it's been misunderstood by a lot of, a lot of people talking about this. So let me explain. In this context, total refers to the breadth and length of efforts the Chinese and Russians are willing to try. Not so much that they want to destroy us totally, because that costs them. More that they're willing to press on levers of influence that we wouldn't normally think of in warfare. And there really isn't a beginning or an end to it. This war is steady state for them, and it's going right now. Now, because of that, there are certain tactics they're going to tend to employ, kind of their go-tos. First off, they know we are employing a deterrent strategy. In essence, we tell the world where the line is, and we threaten them with doom if they cross it. Well, what do you do if someone gives you an ultimatum? Well, you're going to mess with them, right? So the two basic counter strategies to mess back with someone who's trying to deter you are called salami slice and escalate to de-escalate. In salami slice, what they do is they kind of like tiptoe toward the line, right? Take a little slice, take what they can, give it some time, take another one, give it some time, take another one, right? So any given grab or towing toward the line is too small to really justify reacting to, to meet that trigger for the big deterrence, the big cost that we threatened. And you do it one ratchet click at a time and you do it over a very long time scale. Kind of like the geopolitical version of the sibling game, like, I'm not touching you. See, I'm not touching you. Alternatively, there's the escalate to de-escalate option. If they know we're escalating, if they know we're saber rattling, what they can do is skip a couple steps in the escalation and kind of dare us to overreact. That basically puts us in a strategic dilemma where if we respond, we look like we're having a tantrum. The first party to go kinetic 
is going to get seen as the bad guy. Now, the analogy I've heard is like, well, you kick a dog until he bites you, and then you can shoot him. And you can tell the world, see, I said he was dangerous. They actively try to make themselves look like the victims. And they try to make us look like bullies or just plain irrational. Because they're trying to degrade our credibility on the world stage. Now, funny thing about that, you know, kick a dog line. I've heard that analogy used both ways. I've heard it used as an accusation toward Russia and China. And I've heard them use it toward us. So, just kind of a funny side note. Both the Russians and the Chinese use cheap labor and social media together. They pay people to sit at a computer terminal and post or just drive up traffic on clicks and shares on material that bolsters their narrative or hurts their adversary's narrative. Now, that's easy to misunderstand. And I think there's been a lot of discussion about this in the last couple of years. <clears throat> Those posts are not necessarily false or even misleading. Sometimes they're true and just very inconvenient or damaging. But either way, as and they don't care whether it's true or not, they care whether it hurts our narrative and helps their narrative. And if it does, it gets clicks and likes and traffic and comments. The Chinese, especially, and a little bit the Russians, are offering either direct financial investment in ports, roads, factories, railroads, infrastructure, or security assistance to countries in exchange for cooperation. Now, we do that too, just to be clear, but they're doing it a lot. And every place they do it, they're gaining another point of leverage in the world. Someone who they can um, threaten or blackmail. And they aren't looking to help those places. They're looking for access and influence and ultimately resource extraction. They're looking to pull what they can out of those countries they're there to help. And in the case of China, we caught them trying to sucker countries into signing wildly exploitative agreements. Loans they couldn't pay back with an agreement to hand over territory if that country defaulted on the loan. There's a term for that. It's called debt trap diplomacy, and they're pretty good at it. So the lesson from that is if you're making deals with the devil, you need to read the fine print. One thing the Chinese are doing is they're hiding a whole navy in a fleet of fishing vessels because they're trying not to go military, right? These civilian looking fishing boats are out doing fundamentally military things, but trying not to cross the threshold of giving the appearance of military action. And they also look for truly non-military ways to gain leverage, right? Trade deals, fishing rights, monetary policy. They're trying to get the rest of the world onto a non-US dollar reserve currency. That sounds economic and like my eyes are going to glaze over, but it's kind of neat. So here's how this works. Most of the trade that happens in the world happens in US dollars as like the reference standard. And the fact that all that trade happens in U.S. dollars kind of gives us quite a bit of power in the world because we control our dollar, how many we print, that kind of thing. And it's a big vulnerability for countries like Russia and China because when we put sanctions on them um, and they can't move their money around because they can't trade it into dollars, that causes problems for them. So they're trying to come up with workarounds for that. Uh, one is oil for yuan. So they're trying, the, the Chinese are trying to trade in Chinese currency for oil. They're also exploiting international agreements, things like signing on to climate change agreements that impact the signatory economies in pretty big ways. Uh, so the Chinese are happy to sign on to it. They just don't follow them. And so because of that, um, you see a lot of discussion from the U.S. about we need to have a rules-based system. Like, there are rules when you when you make an agreement, you actually have to follow the agreement. And following an or signing an agreement and then not following it, like that's not going to fly. We're going to hold you to it. So, what can we do about it? Well, it starts by understanding that it's happening. Understanding that Russia and China are not our friends. Even when our interests align, even when we're doing business even when they're investing money in us. Understand that neither country wants a shooting war with us, 
but they're both very, in, in a very real way, at war with us. And they want to be able to go there in, into a military uh, fight, and they want to be able to win. And they're deeply resentful and distrustful of us, regardless. They want to see us taken down a peg. And they know our economy is a center of gravity. So they want to see us chase perceived threats with giant expensive defense programs and spend ourselves in a bankruptcy in order to feel safe. Or see us pursue bad domestic policies that are going to screw up our economy. Or see us pursue energy policies that make us reliant on them for raw materials like lithium. Understanding that's what they want and that's what they're trying to do uh, will help. Understand they want to see us burn up our legitimacy and our credibility on the world stage. And know that they aren't bound by our concepts of like rules-based systems, chivalry, boundaries. And they're just as happy, maybe happier, fighting us in the fishing industry or the energy sector as having our satellites fight each other in space. So all of that arms our counter tactics. What we can do about it is from that lens. The first thing we can do and that we must do is we got to keep our economy and our financial solvency strong. When you hear talk about America defaulting on debt, that is a gift to the communist Chinese. America's foreign held debt is, I don't know what you can, you can Google it. It's something like 31 bazillion dollars, something like that. It's, uh, it's giant. And it is, in very many ways, our biggest national security liability. If they can use that to erode global trust in the U.S. dollar or present a viable alternative as the world reserve currency, that is a huge win for them. Remember, though, they don't necessarily want to wreck our economy. They don't want our economy to, to die. They need our economy. But they do want to soften it. They want to soften our advantage, and they want to supplant us in places like energy, finance, monetary policy, and resource extraction. Those sectors are where they think they can dominate, and they're doing everything they can to do that. Another thing we can do is we need to make sure our narrative, our side of the story, challenges theirs. Our adversaries love news stories about violence, drug addiction, poverty, corruption, political chaos in the U.S. They love that. They love stories that make us look like unreli unreliable allies or bad investments. You know, their depiction of us, their cartoon version of America, is that we are broken, hollow, bankrupt. And if you see messaging along those lines, that should stand out to you as part of an organized information campaign. Now, I want to be clear, we can be clear about America's problems and our civil strife, but we can also present a positive narrative, a positive side of our story about that. We can express deep arguments with the Democrats or the Republicans or the gosh darn libertarians, but always with the caveat that when we disagree, we're on the same side, especially when it comes to foreign affairs. So watch out when you see politicians or pundits say things like, Oh, that Republican or Democrat or whatever is our enemy now. No, they're not. We can disagree and be mature enough to say, hey, you know, either I'm going to win the votes or you're going to win the votes. But at the end of the day, we, we are Americans and we are friends. And the people who are not our friends are the Russians and the Chinese. We also need to challenge their efforts, the Chinese and Russian efforts, to suppress criticism about them. And they've gotten pretty aggressive about suppressing criticism, even from Americans. I think anybody, and particularly any American, should be free to point out the contradictions and faults in China and Russia without being afraid of reprisal or censorship. If they come after an American for pointing out the problems in Russia or China, the weight of the U.S. government should come down on Russia and China over that. The truth is a very powerful weapon. One of the most powerful things we can do is expose their bad deeds to the world. So when they try to catch a country in a debt trap, well, one of our big tactics is we can literally sit down with the government of that country and we can read the contract terms to them. 
hey, do you know you're agreeing to this? Hey, do you know that if you don't pay, they get that military base they just built for you? Okay. When they try to get into every phone through TikTok or whatever, we can tell the world what they're up to. And that makes it a lot harder for them to do dastardly things when they know they're going to get caught. When we do talk about China and Russia, it's important that we always separate the people from the regimes. There are plenty of good, honest, helpful, friendly Chinese and Russian people out there. I've liked most of the Russian and Chinese people I've met. I like their food. I like their vodka. But the Putin regime and the Communist Chinese Party, they are making things difficult, not just for us, but especially for their own people. We can drive a wedge between the people and the political leadership, and we need to. They're more scared of us than we are of them. That's that's a strength. The most powerful weapon we have, and this sounds squishy, but I'm dead serious. It's the power of our ideas and our ideals. We need to do everything we can to make sure everyone in Russia and China has access to our story. Our Western media, our social media. But a close second to that, I want them to know that we have a legit military. The power of our military is also a thing that frankly scares them. They don't want a direct confrontation. We know that and we can use that. Another big source of our power is our friends. America has to actively work to be no better friend and no worse enemy. And that has to be more than a bumper sticker. We have to put our money where our mouth is on that. Our relationships with countries like Poland, Germany, Vietnam, the Philippines, those are critical to how we can box these countries in and paralyze them. And we are way more powerful when we operate as a bloc with our partners, our 5i partners, our NATO partners, our G7 partners. There's a new partnership. Um, I can't remember the term for it in the Indo-PACOM, like the big four or something like that. Um, that that creates bigger problems for China than stealth cruise missiles do. And we need to be mature and thoughtful about what we share and what we hide. And this comes up a lot with our partners, right? Uh, the term for this right now is reveal versus conceal. What is it we want to show China and Russia? What do, what do we not want to show them? And it's tricky because the instinct if you think you're being spied on and we are is to try to hide everything. Well, fuck that. That's basic. We're better than that. We can go beyond that. We need to share ideas and get innovation momentum going. We need to share information with our allies. So they're going to trust us and act as empowered and competent partners with us. If we're going to fight as a coalition, but we won't let our allies on a secure network so they can receive the plan or just do basic communication functions. We're hosing ourselves. And some things we want to share with the Chinese and Russians specifically to either menace them or calm them. I'll tell you from personal experience, folks hate this. They hate having to really think about what to, what to hide and what to share. They want big, bright lines over what's classified and what's not. Well, this is part of the security classification guide, so we're good, or it's not. Yeah, you got to be able to work in the gray on this and recognize that sometimes sharing sensitive intel might save the day. That's been a huge part of why Ukraine has done as well as it has in, in its war with Russia. And sometimes hiding something that seems inconsequential, that might also create a real dilemma. So we got to be very careful about what we show and what we hide. What we shouldn't do is freak out. China's trying to get it all in our business. We know that. But I don't have to boycott Panda Express. I don't have to look at every American of Asian heritage with suspicion. That's dumb. We don't have to bankrupt ourselves developing cutting-edge new anti-balloon technology. They would love that if we just tanked all of our money in that. But we need to understand that the battlefield is largely here in the United States and that it affects you. This is a nuanced balancing act and we tend not to handle that well. I need you personally to be alert, but not paranoid. First thing I want you to be alert about is disinformation. 
Just because there is disinformation doesn't mean everything is disinformation or that (laughs) everything I disagree with is disinformation, which is usually how I hear it. Okay. Just because they're messing with us doesn't mean that everything that happens is because they're messing with us. And it's easy to get into that kind of feedback loop. Paralysis through confusion is a strategic failure. We can't do that. A couple examples. Uh, there were rumors that China is flooding the, the U.S. with fentanyl. They might be. It is plausible that they are, right? There isn't a whole lot of evidence for that. There is, however, at least some evidence that they sure as hell haven't done much to stop the flow of illicit drugs into the U.S. So there's what I think and there's what I know. Uh, COVID. China might have made COVID in a lab. Maybe. I don't, it's plausible. We've, we've heard some reporting on that just in the last couple of weeks. But there is a mountain of evidence that they manipulated and suppressed the media narrative about COVID at the beginning of the outbreak in a way that set the rest of the world in a position of disadvantage to handle it and allowed them to exploit it. We know that. We can prove that. Are you seeing the pattern? Stick with what we know. Stick with what we can prove. We know China is aggressively working corporate and industrial espionage. The FBI director has said that on national TV. They are stealing American intellectual property. They're copying it. They're making it with effectively slave labor and selling it back to us cheaper and sometimes faster than we could possibly build it. And they're out competing our companies to do it. They're softening our economy. That is straight up economic warfare. And that has real impact on us and our way of life. But that isn't something the U.S. Pacific fleet can fight. I can't send F-18s against that. You know who's going to catch stuff like that? It's going to be like the San Jose Police Department or the L.A. County Sheriff's Office or the FBI resident agent in Austin, Texas. If a tech company or a biotech company or a software company gets broken into or hacked, that should raise immediate red flags for you. And you should probably be quicker than you think you need to to get the feds involved. That also means cybersecurity and infrastructure security are big deals right now. If someone messes with an electrical substation or a gas pipeline, we got to hunt them down with full force. The way we would hunt Al-Qaeda. And it means if you work security or cybersecurity, uh, you better have your A-game on. You now have to account not just for the kids in the basement, the Mountain Dew and Cheetos, or just the meth heads. You have to account for state actors. And if you work in these fields, it would behoove you to seek out advice from Homeland Security, the CISA, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, and the FBI. Call them up, start a conversation, harden your defenses and build your resilience because they're coming after you. We know that Chinese corporations that are inextricably linked to the Chinese communist regime are setting up operations in small towns across the country. We know that. That might sound hysterical, but it isn't. You can Google it. And that might sound initially to a lot of people, and it has sounded like a win. That's jobs and that's investment. That's a big deal for us. But if you look at the fine print that often comes with, uh, with these opportunities, it comes with conditions. Stuff like sponsoring Chinese citizens to live and work here. Or handing the Chinese government placement and access across the country. A key reference in this discussion is China's national intelligence law from 2017. You can Google that too. Among other things you're going to find, it requires every Chinese organization or citizen to support, assist, and cooperate with state intelligence work. By law, Chinese citizens have to help out their intelligence service. But they're not all spies, probably. Uh, You know, in some cases, it might be a legitimate business effort. Uh, You might buy a pack of straws or aluminum siding made in America. And they sure were made in America, in Allentown, Pennsylvania, where the Fu Ling Corporation makes them. But understand that if the Fu Ling Corporation is making them in Allentown, Pennsylvania, the money largely is going back to China. Best case, what we get when we get that 
is giving China one more point of economic leverage over us. I can't fix that with F-22s or space lasers. I fix that at the city council and the chamber of commerce. So where the rubber meets the road on this is if a Chinese company is offering you or your city a smoking deal on like body warm cameras or helping make your town a smart city or giving you 5G internet or giving your daughter the TikTok app, understand they aren't doing that to help you. They're doing that to help them. And if the deal sounds too good to be true, there's a reason for it. And I'll remind you, if you're making deals with the devil, you got to read the fine print. You got to look at the contract, see what it is you're actually agreeing to. Technology comes up a lot in the discussion. Tech is a big part of every future fight. We know that. It's a big part of this fight. And tech is changing and a little bit scary because we don't know where all it's going. We just know it's going places. But we need to keep our technological edge. That edge is where we have a lot of our advantage. Innovation happens in free societies in a way that doesn't happen in authoritarian societies. We can impose technological surprises on our adversaries. And that is, that's, that's where we're going to get the big wins. But with that corporate espionage thing, it's going to take a lot of work to preserve that surprise. So again, we got to think about when to share so we can get the collaboration that gets us the innovation and when to hide uh, to keep China out of it. And with that emerging technology, we need to recognize how innovations like artificial intelligence and deep fakes can be used to screw with our perception of reality and how it can enable a disinformation campaign or foment internal strife or mask a foreign covert action. We need to recognize how social media can be manipulated with garbage posts and traffic. But again, we can't be paralyzed by that. We just have to work harder to sort signal from noise and fight to build our situational awareness. It's important for us to recognize that foreign adversaries are trying to inject themselves in our domestic politics. They're trying to get us to hate each other and get so distracted that we don't believe our own national security institutions or our own president. Seriously stop and consider. If you are in a total generational war with some made-up country, let's call it, I don't know, Stolichnaya, and you know that going into a shooting war would probably mean the you know, mutually assured destruction, the end of your regime, and you have a choice between buying some badass stealth hypersonic missile with lasers or paying a couple guys in the basement uh, to sow enough discord that the country of Stolichnaya doesn't believe their own president when he says you're a threat, which one do you think you're going to invest in? And do you care whether you spread those rumors about President Ivan or President Dmitry? No. Whether you voted for any given president or not, you need to listen when they're talking about big foreign threat actors. Now, you can have whatever opinion you want about Bush or Obama or Trump or President Biden. I know I have my opinions. And you can have any opinion you want about how they played the hand they were dealt. But understand the entire national security establishment of the U.S., our military, our State Department, the extended family of intelligence... We are all trying to figure out how to gain and maintain an advantage in this. Putin would love, love for you to be so distrustful of your own president, whoever that president is, that you think he's foreign compromised. And it stands out to me that both the current president and the past president, how often I hear people say, oh yeah, he's, he's working for the Chinese or he, he's working for the Russians. Understand that is, that's a huge win for a foreign adversary fighting a democracy. When that, that rumor takes hold of people, that's a huge win for them. Driving a wedge between the people, the state, and the army is how Sun Tzu and Clausewitz taught us to fight. We got to stop handing that to them. Now, I need to be clear, I'm not suggesting that anyone who criticizes the president is some Soviet Chinese spy, right? Obviously. In fact, the right to criticize the president is one of the things that makes us great. The fact that you can't make fun of 
Winnie the Pooh over in China is one of the things that makes China weak and pathetic. What I'm trying to explain, what I'm highlighting, is that the theme that Americans cannot trust the President of the United States, that is useful and convenient to the Russians and Chinese. So there's a question here. In a free society, how do we manage that inherent right to criticize the president and balance that feeling that you may not be able to trust the president if they're from the opposing party? Well, they're from the bad guy party, right? Well, the answer is sunlight. The election process should be so rigorous that even if the opposition wins, those dirty, rotten Republicans, those dirty, rotten Democrats, or those... (laughs) <laughs> libertarians, not that they ever win an election, but if they did, well, it's got to be so rigorous that both sides are confident the elected officials are thoroughly vetted. And here's a clue. We are already most of the way there. We do have a rigorous and adversarial system, and it does throw sunlight on politicians. So even if the other guy wins, I at least know my own party exposed whatever shady business they've been up to. While we're at it, I think we should throw some sunlight on Chinese and Russian politicians. But we don't beat China by acting like China, by saying you're not allowed to criticize people. Like, that doesn't work. We've got to be able to criticize. But I want you to think critically about the narrative that whoever the president is, is some foreign compromised agent. Who does that help? I mentioned situational awareness, and you know, this is a favorite topic for us here on the podcast. Mike has his spiel about it. I've got mine. Our big message on situational awareness is that it's not a status. It's not a box you check. It's a thing you have to actively and continuously fight for with conscious perception and critical thinking. That's how you wade through an active information campaign. That's how you catch on to exploitative business practices or subtle efforts to rig the game against us. It's how you balance prudence with paranoia. You get there with a sense of skepticism. Skepticism is a powerful word. If you see a claim on the internet, you can be open-minded about it. You can be an open-minded skeptic, right? Okay, I'll listen. Show me your evidence. And then when they do show you evidence, do some evaluation on that evidence. Does it actually support the claim? Is it actually relevant? Is it valid? Can I cross-corroborate it? Okay, so someone claims the president's really a lizard. Okay, cool. Prove it. Someone claims the COVID vaccine makes your dick fall off. Okay, prove it. Someone claims China made COVID in a lab. Okay. Prove it. The bigger the claim, the bigger the evidence has to be. Extraordinary claims need extraordinary evidence. And a claim made without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. That is how you save yourself time and pain in this um, murky information game. Because you can't let it paralyze you, the fact that uh, there is information campaigning happening. So where do we go from here? Well, I think we can take some solace in that we're probably not on the brink of World War III. So you probably don't need to build a zombie bunker or stockpile cat food. So that's good. Understand that war can involve more than tanks and bombers. And in this case, uh, it might be a lot more invasive to the homeland than tanks and bombers. But it's going to take the form of insidious economic and information warfare. I think you should take a hard look at some of the documents that are available to you. The U.S. National Security Strategy is on the White House website. You can go check it out. Uh, We'll link to it in the show notes. I don't necessarily agree with all of it. It's a free country. I'm allowed to disagree with things. Uh, But I think it will give you some insights and serious insights to how senior U.S. government officials are thinking about this this tension that we now have. I think you should read the book or you can listen to it on Audible. I'm a big fan of that. Uh, There's a book called War Without Rules, 
which is an American kind of Cliff's Notes interpretation of a Chinese paper that came out about 20 years ago called Unrestricted Warfare. I think you should go find the book War with Russia by Sir Richard Shereff. I think that combination, the NSS, War Without Rules, and War with Russia, take those three together and you'll start to get a sense of kind of what's actually happening in the world. As a final thought, our position in the world, our primacy in the world is not a given. It's not a birthright. We got to fight for it. And I'm more than happy to coexist with Russia and China. And personally, I think we can and should try to be friends and partners. And they have their own place as great countries in their own right. But they don't get to steal Ukraine. They don't get to steal the South China Sea. They don't get to insidiously trap America or our friends in debt and bankruptcy as a matter of national strategy. They don't get to goad the extreme wings of our domestic political groups into violence. Now, they can play games, but they need to know we're going to play games too. And for us to do that well, we have to stop looking at the South China Sea or Eastern Europe as some giant two-dimensional football field or chessboard. We have to play knowing they are literally all up in our business. And maybe it's time to get all up in theirs. We've got to be smart about it. So I think that's all I got. I look forward to hearing your questions. When we publish this, go ahead and hit us up if you have any questions or insights. Uh, I'd love to hear them. Be safe out there. Be smart out there. And for God's sakes, delete the TikTok app. Thanks. All right, guys, that's all we got for tonight. Don't forget that we put out new episodes on the 1st and the 15th of every month. If you like what we're doing, you can have our Patreon. Give us a buck for each new episode. That money's going to go back into bringing you good content. If you want to interact with us, you could find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We are at Tac Tangents. You can also email info at tacticaltangents.com. And one last thing, our uh, Facebook discussion group. We've got a little group going on Facebook. If you go to the groups tab on our page, you can join it. Um, we've got more followers on our page than we have in the group. So I know there's some of you out there following the Facebook page that are on Facebook that are not in the group. Lots of like-minded people in there. Uh, so come hang out with us. Uh, all right. That's all we got. Good talk.